radicalization while addressing the Bimstick experience and suggesting the way forward as fundamentalist organizations extensively use the internet and social media for radicalization, recruitment, and spreading their propaganda. May I now request Mr. So Mint, Managing Director and Editor-in-Chief of the Mizima Media Group, Myanmar, Chair Session 1, and our distinguished panelists, Mr. Shahab Inam Khan, Research Director, Bangladesh Enterprise Institute, uh, Shruti Pandalai, Associate Fellow, Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, India, Dr. Min Zhao, who Executive Director, Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security, uh, Nitin Gokhale, Editor-in-Chief, Strategic News International, Mr. Umakant Adhikari, Nepal, Dr. Sa Sandunika Hasangani, Research Fellow, Lakshman, Kadir Gamar Institute of International Relations and Strategic Studies, and uh, Arthur Tongen Lecturer, Sukhothoi Tamathrit Open University to please take their seats on the dais. I request all speakers to finish their presentations uh, in the allotted 10 minutes so that the floor can be open to the audience uh, too. Uh, we will uh, keep the protocol of having uh, the chair ring the bell at 9 minutes uh, once and twice at 10 minutes. Uh, now I now hand over uh, the proceedings uh, to the chair, Mr. Somint. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you, thank you everyone uh, for uh, having this uh, first session. I personally would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for having me here back in Delhi. I mean, after a few days or a few months, I was here just uh, recently, and uh, I came back uh, across the India Myanmar border because we were bringing ASEAN diplomats from based in New Delhi to Tamu. But, uh, to show the border region. So it was a pleasure having uh, been here and uh, for giving me this opportunity to moderate and chair the session. Uh, the, the, uh, I'm requested uh, to chair the session uh, on the issue and on the topic, I think, which is uh, one of the immediate concerns of the countries within the PIMSTEC, which is uh, internet, and uh, I mean, by the way, it is not only within the BIMSTEC, it is globally. Uh, internet and social media as a tool for radicalization, BIMSTEC experience and the way forward. So uh, this is a very uh, timely discussion and uh, we have uh, uh, distinguished, experienced uh, speakers uh, from the BIMSTEC countries and uh, I was told to have 10 minutes each, and I'd like to take uh, five minutes out of that uh, to take up, uh, uh, opportunity as a chair. Uh, one, for me, th these are some of my thoughts uh, when we are talking of uh, radicalization through internet and social media. Uh, definitely, there is a role of the government, the state. Each government should consider sharing lessons on what works in countering online radicalization at the national level and also regional levels by increasing intergovernmental information exchange and creating new online communities. There is, I think that is where still we all are trying still to make efforts. And uh, since I'm coming from the media background, media need to engage the issue of diversity in society with an aim to fostering greater tolerance on or social cohesion and thereby abetting structure dialogue and the management of intergroup conflict. And lastly, due to the lack of empirical studies, it is said to be difficult to identify specific trends and conclusions on social media and radicalization in this part of the world. To combat this shortcoming, definitely 
regional centers of expertise need to be established to facilitate network and research hubs that can focus on violent radicalization and its specific challenges in cyberspace. Online, countermeas online countermeasures need to be context sensitive and challenge extremist representations, either its claims and hate speech. Proactive strategies tend to take two major forms. One is online counter narratives and gra grassroots anti-propaganda initiatives. These two approaches should be complementary in their implementation. Having said this, of uh, some of my thoughts, uh, I like to uh, 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 welcome the speakers first from Bangladesh to start with Mr. Shahib Inam Khan uh, from Bangladesh. I mean, since it is uh, uh, the the bio is written here, just allow me to uh, mention about who he is. The professor, by he's a professor uh, uh, working at the Department of International Relations at the Jahangir Nagar University. If I'm not uh, uh, wrongly spelled, uh, pronounced from Bangladesh, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is always, always a pleasure to be back in Delhi and uh, my heartfelt gratitude to Vivekanand uh, International Foundation for inviting us to be here and of course our uh, gratitude to BIMSTEC for hosting such an important initiative in which we have gathered outstanding pool of intellectuals to discuss uh, an important uh, issue like internet, which is kind of a, uh, an endless subject uh, and which is almost has become an organic subject, uh, has a growth uh, which has no beginning and no end sort of uh, phenomena in the contemporary world, which has essentially changed the entire uh, idea of statehood, nationhood, and perhaps what we used to traditionally consider as security. Now, given that parameter, if we look back to the inaugural session, uh, the speakers actually set a fantastic uh, uh, parameters that what we should be thinking about over the years coming. One of the agenda that actually intrigued my mind is whether Indonesia should be included in BIMSTEC or not. And I think this is where I should start my uh, my discussion, because this is something I think every BIMSTEC country would perhaps like to think about, is uh, look at internet, look at radicalization. There are two countries which are essentially a great victim of uh, online radicalization is Bangladesh and perhaps if you take Indonesia. Now, if you look at the Indonesian radicalization process, which also is marked by transnational uh, uh, ideological crisis, perhaps, uh, is pretty much vibrant over there. Now, what is the fascinating part about Indonesia is over the period of time, they have created a fantastic models where they included community, where they reinvigorated their law enforcement agencies. They have created a fantastic role models on how to create uh, uh, role models to counter uh, extremist ideologies and perhaps they have taken greater interest in reaching out to the communities which are already affected. Now even if you take that argument for the sake of this particular uh, session and I think uh, Indonesia perhaps can provide technical support to BIMSTEC countries now uh, actually, uh, actually struggling with the ideas of ideological uh, battle or ideological extremism, whether it is in the front of left or right, or perhaps uh, in terms of economics. Now, even if you take the idea of Indo-Pacific, which was being discussed earlier, now one of the key instruments for Indo-Pacific would be, of course, technology. 
because all these countries would essentially need technologies. Now, technologies in terms of innovation, technologies in terms of incubation, technologies in terms of spreading, or perhaps creating markets or creating a pool of people who would be able to use these technologies. There's no point always thinking about that we need technologies, but if we can't create human resources that can use that technology, will not be uh, essentially helpful initiative. So therefore, even now Bangladesh is also thinking about what will happen if the ready-made garments industries become absolutely automated. Will that help Bangladesh's job uh, prospect or, un, uh, or employment growth process in the future? So we have to really think about that how uh, this can help or this will become peril in future. So, but essentially this has become definitely a development indicator. So where we have seen that Indonesians are doing really fantastic job. And even if you take the case of maritime concerns about uh, the Indonesians, and that is pretty much there. So henceforth, in terms of maritime capacity, we will be seeing that Indonesians will be very much forthcoming in helping the Thais and Sri Lankans and Bangladeshis and everyone and, put a, put a, and lend their capacity for our collective benefit. Now, going back to the whole idea of social media as a tool of radicalization. Now, even if uh, I had the pri privilege of working in Indonesia as well as in Maldives, uh, as, as UNDP is one, uh, one of the pioneering uh, consultants to, to really look into the radicalization process in three grounds. One is the migrant workers. I looked into that. I looked into the female, and I, of course, looked into the people who went to uh, join the foreign lands in the name of ideological uh, battles. Now, if you look into that, there are a number of indicators came up. If I take the online cases, so we have done many online mappings of Bangladeshi workers, Sri Lankan workers, Indian workers, and perhaps Indonesian workers, even to a great extent Filipino workers. And we have seen that the trends are quite, uh, quite diverse. And it's very difficult to generalize that online radicalization is actually a homogeneous process. It's a, it is essentially a heterogeneous process. In many cases, we have seen that economic exploitation remains as a big problem, which can be tapped in by a number of transnational entities, and we have seen that that has been happening. Now, the case of homegrown versus the transnational uh, entities on the online is a gray area. So this is exactly where uh, our capacity lies in a very, very nuanced stage. So therefore, the issue of freedom of information as well as how to deal with this information remains as a big, big concern. When we looked into the hate speech part in Maldives, when we looked into the hate speech part in Bangladesh, and even to a great extent in the Indian context, there's a very thin line about the political ideology versus the religious ideologies. Now, that's again one great concern, even if you look into the YouTube. Now, YouTube comments, if you look into the YouTube comments, very rarely you find that this is actually religious. Essentially, it, the narrative eventually converts into a political statements and therefore the whole problem lies then how do we actually redefine hate speeches in the new context that is being being changing now even uh, uh, UNDP was essentially involved in mapping the hate speech involved in violent extremism speeches on on uh, uh, available in online domain where we found a fascinating uh, fascinating trends now, as the technology changes, and now the whole idea of technology has uh, broken the idea of literacy. Initially, we used to think that you need to be literate, you need to understand alphabets, you need to read. These sort of issues are no longer required because the technology has become intuitive. The more intuitive it becomes, it becomes you, you become much more able uh, or much more able to infuse this entire technology to a greater pool of people who were eventually been, not been under the radar of the state or under the radar of the civil society for a long, long time. And one of the major issues came up in that violent uh, extremism landscape is long, long time we haven't been focusing on women. 
Now, when we looked into the women's part, that became a greater, greater concern for us because the new focus for the ideological concerns are in, into, the, uh, into the female or the gender dimension. The more we, make, more we focus on gender empowerment, we have to understand the extremist entities are clever enough to focus more on the gender dimension of the radicalization too. Now, saying that, what happened in the BIMSTEC round, so if you take all these new initiatives, has to be brought in because all these countries are actually facing this problem together. And none of these countries can actually see these things in an isolation because every uh, female issues that you bring in, uh, migration issues that you bring in, technological issues that you bring in has ripple over effect. Even if you take the YouTube, if you take the Facebook, is no longer the prime problem. The prime problem is our graduation from the surface web to deep web to dark web. Now, that is another problem. Now, only 5 to 7% of the surface web we can actually penetrate. But what about the dark web? Now, if you go back to the theory of uh, literacy no longer matters, means graduating to the dark web will be a matter of time. Now, we have found a number of pockets, not only in Bangladesh, but in many other places, particularly in Saudi Arabia. And I also was working on this particular issue that shifting to dark web or perhaps bringing the colloquial of dark web into the surface was a major concern. Now, if you take the jihadi narratives of saffron narratives or ultra, na ultra Buddhist narratives or any narratives that you talk about, if you take it out, if you look into the dark web, what kind of narratives can you see? We can only see the tip of the iceberg. So that's the problem of the technology, that's the problem of our own capacity, and that's the problem of our interception capacity. And the last one is the very recent study that came out from SECTEV was very interesting by saying that it is no longer the jihadi issue that is being dominating the, the, the surface narratives, it is the civil society narratives that is dominating the surface narratives by saying, let us demonize the civil society, therefore we start from there. Now how do we deal with it? Uh, can I take just one more minute, Chairman? I think this is a very important point that uh, we have come to, is, is the issue of uh, what kind of narratives then are we have to deal with. So is it a top to bottom or down to uh, top? Essentially, we have been talking about counter narratives for a long, long time. We have experimented with counter narrative in Bangladesh. We have experimented counter narratives in Indonesia. And we have seen Pakistan having uh, counter narratives in Pakistan and even in Saudi Arabia. But that actually didn't work to a great extent. The very simple reason is the moment the state prescribes it, it becomes politicized. So therefore, the rejection comes in. So rather than building it from the statist point of view, uh, the capacity of the community has to be dealt. And, and uh, if I uh, may, uh, uh, may tell you that the Indonesians have actually built a super capacity over there, as well as if you look into the Egyptians and even to a great extent, the Iranians have also developed some models which can eventually be uh, studied by the civil society. And the last point over here is uh, what BIMSTEC can actually look over here. I think the whole idea of radicalization cannot be seen only from the statist or the security point of view. It has to be seen from a community point of view. And the role of the media has long been ignored here. Because whatever you write in media is essentially can be interpreted in many ways. As a result, the media interpretation by the extremist entities is always there. Now, how do they interpret it? And how do you counter it remains. So, so therefore, the conundrum between the freedom of speech and the limits of speech has to be really dealt with. Now, who is going to do it essentially remains as a subject to be debated within a platform, certainly like BIMSTEC. And finally, again, uh, I would like to thank uh, BIMSTEC for all, all these initiatives. And I would like to say that our prime minister's commitment in bringing a much more transparent uh, regime uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, internet governance uh, is something that uh, probably BIMSTEC uh, 
uh, eventually can discuss in its own platforms. Hence, information sharing is, is a credible idea. But again, the moment we talk about information sharing, the question of what would be the interoperability of that particular information sharing will be, and whether this will be actually leading towards the curtailing of freedom of speech, uh, remains as a question as a result that also creates some sort of uneasy uh, situation, uneasy vibes within the new generation which are the flag bearers of this certain movement called internet or online, offline radicalization that we are dealing with. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shaheb Inankam for, for sharing your uh, own experiences in Bangladesh and also for bringing uh, uh, the Indonesian experiences into the discussion. Yes, uh, I think uh, no message can guarantee to neutralize ex extremism and radicalization. However, uh, via community-based and long-term engagement, it is possible to gain insight into local narratives and networks. With this, uh, I would like to invite uh, 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 Ms. Shruti Pandal, Pandal Pandalai, uh, I'm sorry for the wrong pronunciation, I am sure, uh, who is uh, associate uh, fellow at the IDSA, Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. Please. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gupta, VIF, all your delegates uh, for uh, having given me the honor and privilege to participate in this discussion today. Uh, the previous speaker pretty much set up the context of our conversation for us today. However, I think you hit all the uh, points that we need to talk about. It's really not the tool, but the message that we need to deal with. Having said that, let me quickly say that my uh, journey with researching this subject actually uh, started under Dr. Gupta when we took on the project of social media uh, and, uh, ch and its challenge to national security in terms of looking at it uh, as a, you know, what are the challenges that lie, what is the opportunities that lie, and how does it impact this entire national security conversation. And I think the thrust of our argument even then was to use social media as a force multiplier in the national security conversation. Uh, and so today, my comments are going to stick to that. Uh, I'm going to quickly tell you a little bit about what we are thinking in terms of the uh, threat perception in India, a little about what my organization is doing in terms of uh, our research and looking at, you know, when we're talking about a think tank conference, uh, my, as terms of what are the deliverables in terms of outputs of research and subjects that we should take, you know, focus on uh, so that we can collaborate and share a lot more on the research pool uh, that we are building individually in our countries. I think, I think the last couple of months in India, what we've sort of seen in terms of the social media chatter that we've picked up is that there is a large threat perception coming in and uh, if we are talking about violent extremism online, there's a particular narrative that is being built around India. It's, it's almost, if you look at, we've slowly done a little bit of work monitoring the online sort of conversation, especially t targeting the Indian Muslim community and we've picked up a lot of the narrative which says that, you know, uh, there is a resurgent global jihadi narrative that has no more reasons to be drawn to India than ever before. The fact that the Islamic State chose to use South Asia uh, as a sort of an example to stage its comeback, uh, comeback in the region is being framed in terms of reference that, you know, the Easter bombings in Sri Lanka uh, has to raise many flags in, in the subcontinent for us. Why is this? The narrative says that, you know, an Islamic State which is being pulverized at its home is finding new bastions and South Asia much to everyone's surprise, is the new bastion. Actually, I'll correct myself. I don't think it's a surprise very much if you look in retrospect to some of the material that has been coming out of their propagandist machinery. Um, you also have seen that there have been a lot of statements that have come out from the Islamic State social media propaganda divisions which talk about the vilayat -e hind They've been speaking about it for a long time, but now the propaganda push on subjects like these have been far more uh, persuasive than ever before. And um, the appointment of a new leader, Abu Muhammad al-Bangali, uh, as the face to lead this movement, 
targeting the South Asian subcontinent and particularly India has to be seen in a particular context. I think there is an assessment, at least in the narrative that is being pushed out in the online uh, sort of domain in terms of a sustained <coughs> public relations offensive by the Islamic State and other uh, violent extremist organizations that uh, this is the opportun opportune time to step into India, look at what's happening in India, look at the churning that's taking place. You have the decision on Jammu and Kashmir. You also have the recent decision on a communal conflict, uh, communal uh, sort of legal decision on a communal conflict that has come out recently, which has been framed. Uh, and ironically, using, using Western media headlines to show uh, that India is no longer uh, the safe place that it used to uh, claim to be and that the communal tensions within India make it an opportune time for organizations like the Islamic State to breach uh, the mind of the Indian Muslim. Now this is sort of the context of the narrative uh, that has been there and this shift is important to understand because in the past a lot of the propaganda only fo sort of focused on trying to get a few uh, recruits out of the country. Now they're aiming for an ideological shift and this is something that we uh, need to sort of factor in, in when we talk about, you know, understanding the narrative at play and then therefore building counter narratives. Um, there is also, um, you know, a lot that is being talked about in terms of the fragility of the Indian social fabric now and that is being constantly pushed into the propaganda domain. And the fact that now is the time that the Indian community will not to be able to withstand a fresh assault by organizations which are targeting so. There are other consequences also. When we are talking about social media and online radicalization, we need to understand the numbers that we are dealing with. Last time, I think uh, Nitin Sa and I were at a similar sort of uh, podium here at VIF discussing numbers. And if you look at just the uh, figures that India sort of boasts of, we have 400 million inter social, social media users in India. And this is between the age group of 18 to 30. This is what I'm talking about. And if you look at the latest sort of Reuters uh, uh, report that is done on online social media, 75% of the Indian population gets its news from your phones. Now when we are also talking about radicalization and the communal, you know, how uh, propaganda is talking about uh, the communal content in our larger narratives, Look, think about the uh, issue of fake news. I mean, a, a lot of the counter narratives that we are coming up are not really uh, targeting radicalization as much as we are talking about internal security challenges, which are then sort of weaved into the larger discourse on radicalization and counterterrorism. Now, uh, this is, is a, a New York Times headline actually called it a public health crisis in India and it's true. Uh, we did a study uh, with organizations called fa like Facebook and Twitter and they brought out some uh, figures that 90% of people just forward news that they get on their phones without even verifying it. Now these, uh, these are individual habits. We can talk about larger issues of you know building counter narratives, talking about targeting uh, individual behavior, but the fact remains that you can't control what uh, pre-existing uh, uh, sensitivities and what we call a confirmation bias and the absence of a traditional media gatekeeper in terms of wetting of information has not been more acutely felt than it is being felt right now. So I think we are dealing with a crisis which have multiple prongs that need to be dealt with when we are looking at it in terms of a holistic approach. Uh, so when we come down to, you know, we would, the NIA came out with a report that 70% of people who in India who are being seen as targeted by online, online sort of media radicalization and finding themselves susceptible to it are educated, come from fairly middle class and upper middle class families. And these are the people who are pushing this narrative forward. Now the question remains why? And I think the way the narrative has been built around explains to you why that, you know, we are going, we're seeing this sort of resurgence. There's also, we, the IDSA did, in fact, uh, you know, my colleague uh, Adil Rashid, who does a fantastic job in terms of uh, the counterterrorism uh, task force uh, at IDSA, did a survey for us to understand that when we get projects to say build a counter narrative, someone like me who has a media background can come in and be the communication professional. But if I don't understand the narrative, if I don't understand the theological concepts that we are trying to sort of build 
an alternate narrative to how do we do it. So uh, the one of the first steps we did was to find, do an art sort of survey. Uh, uh, there was a team that went to various parts of the country to sort of tap into the mind of the young Indian Muslim. And we came back actually with great results because there was an overwhelming sort of majority of people who said that, you know, we are quite informed in the way online radicalization works, especially the student community. However, there were various points of inflection there that were very uh, important to us. One talked about the lack of faith in uh, institutions, ghettoization of population in various parts of the country, and the constant need to remind uh, people that, you know, that the Indian Muslim was far away from the Kashmiri cause. They, the, they looked at it as a bilateral situation, and they didn't like to prove their patriotism time and time and again. I think these are pre-existing sensitivities that we need to take into place. Now, finally, going into, uh, uh, you know, counter-narratives and the need to know them. Like I said, the Counter-Terrorism Task Force and IDSA, if I can spend a minute on it, Chair, what we have tried to do is for professionals like me who need to come in and build the concept of strategic communication, we have put together a glossary of terms that are used by violent extremist organizations online to justify their causes of violence. For example, the Islamic State comes and says X, Y, and Z is why we are, you know, uh, going ahead with violent action. Someone like me or some any other lay person to understand and put it into context, we've bought, built in a glossary of terms of theological concepts that helps us to counter it. Number two, the counter narratives also uh, bring into mind the socialization and the context to which we are targeting. So it can't be one blanket approach to all, and that's something that we are following. Finally, just to sort of conclude with a couple of comments on where we need to target research. You very uh, correctly pointed out that, you know, you looked at uh, gender, for example. I think gender remains one of the most understudied concepts in terms of radicalization in our country. We had one of the, uh, uh, one professor, when we did the conference in IDSA about two years ago on combating terrorism, she did, uh, Christine Fair, who's fairly well known, did a very good paper on uh, women and the lashkar e -toyba. This was one in a series of 25 papers that didn't look at gender at all. So I think that remains a huge sort of glaring gap. There's a lot of, uh, lot of pressure and sort of a lot of uh, attention given to the tools. Social media might perhaps correct right now because of the velocity, the ability to uh, convey the information in such a short range of time to so many people remains important. But I think the focus on the tool rather than the message remains a huge problem in our case even now. Uh, uh, the other on sort of lacuna remains that there's extremist threats online and offline are different and we need to understand them. And the importance really needs to be given to the tipping point. What, you know, you have come and stood at the uh, precipice. It's on, you fall by the content, but there are certain reasons that pushed you towards that precipice. I think we've still not discovered the six degrees of separation and that needs to be an area that we need to focus on. Media literacy, you mentioned that, Chair, and uh, I hope that a lot more work needs to be done because, like we are said, social media, fake news, and uh, uh, disinformation campaigns are huge uh, potent tools that are being employed to exacerbate the problem. I'll stop here, and I'll be happy uh, to take the discussion forward. Thank you, uh, Ms. Shruti, uh, for your uh, insights and also uh, for your hard work uh, in research in this uh, area, I, uh, I know you have been doing quite a lot of work. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the danger of, uh, for me, the danger of uh, fake news, disinformation campaign by interested groups through internet and social media, particularly like Facebook. Uh, I think uh, uh, my, for me, my two cents uh, is that uh, we could also consider content sharing among the BIMSTEC countries. Instead of we taking uh, as media or whatever the researchers we do, we take from writers or AP or AFP, definitely we do have our own uh, resources and knowledge and uh, uh, authentic information and facts within our region. I think we could consider content sharing among us uh, within BIMSTEC with this uh, I would like to uh, request my fellow uh, uh, colleague from Myanmar, Dr. Minzo Wu, who is currently serving as executive director at Myanmar Institute for Peace and Inclusion on some of the anal analysis. So Myanmar currently is about 21.8 million Facebook users, which is about 
uh, 30, 40% uh, of the uh, uh, total population. So when we study the, how Facebook uh, as a major social media so its impact on the armed conflict, especially on ethnic armed conflict in Myanmar. So there are different armed groups and different groups utilize Facebook to mobilize, uh, to gather support uh, for uh, their cause. So one is about the ethnic mobilization. So ethnic mobilization started in Facebook or initiated by those groups on the Facebook in the context of free speech. So if you look at that messages constructed in ethnic mobilization, they are totally you know, under the category of the free speech and uh, you won't see either hate speech or radicalization. But this message of ethnic mobilization at some point turned into radicalization. Uh, so there's a very fine line between free speech and radicalization when it came to the uh, ethnic mobilization. So once this message of ethnic mobilization uh, is absorbed by the, uh, the user and the user is recruited into some extent, <coughs> then they change the platform from public domain to more private domains. For example, like uh, uh, the user uh, read through those mobilization messages and get excited and they started contacting those people who generate those messages. So then once the user contacted, then they no longer discuss in a public domain. They may be drawn into like, okay, let's go to a WhatsApp group. Why don't you just join those closed WhatsApp groups? So those, those closed domains are very difficult to monitor. Then this is how the radicalization initiative. So there are a lot of misconceptions about the radicalization in the social media. Because the social media is not uh, just a very initial step of the mobilization, but most of the mo radicalizations happen in a closed forum, the closed platform. Uh, another uh, the aspect of the use of the social media is the military propaganda. Uh, when there are armed clashes, the groups supporting whatever side they will use social media to propagate uh, who is winning and who is losing. Um, and there's also a lot of dead body politics, a dead body uh, propaganda. The groups tend to use the pictures of the dead bodies uh, to stimulate uh, military propaganda. Another purpose uh, we found out is the fundraising. So social media is a very good platform uh, to utilize uh, for fundraising for that kind of uh, mobilization and radicalization. Uh, now there's a communication with supporters. And in our research, one of the armed groups uh, in, uh, between India and Myanmar border, India, Bangladesh border, use Messenger, Facebook Messenger, to, uh, to uh, address speeches uh, to their supporters uh, in the front line and in the villages. And also, the, they were used as a public relation, also uh, 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 to spread hate speeches. Another element about the hate speeches is when Facebook started taking action on the hate speeches, those official accounts no longer propagate or distribute hate speeches. Then they create proxy accounts. Uh, to spread hate speeches. So if you are detecting hate speeches and you won't see that on the official accounts, but instead a lot of these proxy accounts become the uh, uh, generator of uh, the hate speeches. And also when we talk about the CSO, the civil society organization, when uh, the, the role of the civil society on the social media is a double-edged sword. So civil society can also participate to counter radicalization. On the other hand, civil society itself become the generator of the hate speeches. Uh, especially when it comes to ethnic conflict, civil society is taking side based on the identity, uh, their ethnicity and identification of the ethnicity. They become uh, the uh, rank and file of the hate speeches uh, in the war of the, uh, the social media. 
Uh, another aspect we also should look into is the Facebook as a social media platform become an actor in those uh, social media campaigns. Because Facebook in Myanmar case, they are very active in providing censorship and the uh, the, uh, censoring the content. What content is allowed on the Facebook and what content is not allowed. So the Facebook itself became the actor uh, in the social media uh, in radicalization. Um, but on the other hand, even though the Facebook is trying to uh, target his speeches and radicalization, it is very difficult when it comes to the content. Even though Facebook has a lot of technical and financial resources uh, to target the hate speeches, it is increasingly uh, difficult. Uh, in our analysis, when Facebook was very good at targeting like uh, uh, interfaith hate speeches, but hate folk can do very little or have very less effective in countering inter-ethnic hate speeches. Uh, for example, like a lot of hate speeches are written in many minority languages. Uh, Facebook is not familiar. And also, like, configurative messages. For example, like somebody going to post a dead body of a soldiers and say good morning. It's a hate speech, but Facebook cannot detect. So uh, in terms of when it comes to training an AI, you need a very good team that can tech and that can train your programs to uh, identify what constitute hate speeches in many different forms, not just only words, but also how pictures uh, convey uh, different messages as well. Uh, the last point I would like to make is how, when we move forward uh, countering radicalization on the social media, the cooperation between uh, the, the, the platform and the governments are very important. Now for the role of the Facebook in Myanmar and how the government of Facebook can work together to reduce radicalization and using Facebook platform as a, uh, to, pro to promote the armed conflict uh, will be very uh, critical. But on the other hand, there are also some uh, limitations. For example, like a lot of these companies, they don't want to open offices in your own country. Because once they open offices, their own country, they will be viable to your legal constituencies. They don't want that. That's a one issue. Now, another issue is a taxation issue. So they don't want to pay tax to your own country, so they don't want to office in your country. That's why they can avoid uh, the, uh, the taxation. And the, uh, the last one I would like to make it in the future, uh, those regional blocks uh, like ASEAN or BINSTEP, they have to start exploring what could be the common standards uh, we can uphold uh, when talking to uh, those uh, social media platforms of big companies in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Minzo Wu, uh, for sharing your thoughts and insights uh, from Myanmar. Uh, particularly for bringing the critical issue of uh, ethnic uh, languages, multiple ethnic languages. Country like Myanmar, which has many ethnic nationalities and with many languages and also dialects. And uh, I think uh, national strat uh, strategies should be tailored to look at context and uh, by using uh, multiple social media platforms and also by through the uh, multiple languages. Uh, many times in country like in Myanmar, Facebook, we cannot detect uh, uh, the ethnic languages, uh, mainly because uh, people are, uh, are going through uh, um, um, uh, Burmese language, which is the majority. With this, uh, I'd like to uh, request uh, Mr. Nitin Kukali. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, Mr. Nitin Gokhale, uh, who, who we knew many years ago, and, uh, and uh, he's a senior journalist and editor, and uh, founder and editor-in-chief uh, of uh, SNI, and uh, I mean, he's a veteran journalist. That's what I know. Yeah, thank you very much. Please go ahead. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am a last-minute addition to this um, uh, uh, distinguished panel. Thanks to uh, my association with VIF here, um, old uh, you know seniors and uh, veterans who have pulled me in here. Uh, so uh, all that I am going to sort of uh, limit myself to say because there are experts who study this. Uh, as a journalist, there is uh, one advantage and one disadvantage. One advantage is that journalists can quickly um, sort of uh, get details of uh, what they want, if, even if they have been pulled in at the last moment. But uh, also the disadvantage is that you don't have the depth uh, which all these academics and uh, researchers bring to the subject. But I'll just uh, put uh, to the House uh, two or three uh, points about uh, internet and radicalization. And uh, my previous speaker, uh, immediately preceding me, spoke about the difficulty of uh, detecting hate speech between inter-ethnic uh, and interfaith, uh, you know, uh, conflicts which are there. And I can see it because uh, I was myself based in the Northeast uh, for 23 years, where inter-ethnic conflicts are again as uh, raging as uh, India's Northeast I'm talking about, uh, where, uh, like Myanmar or other, other countries in uh, Southeast Asia. Now, uh, the hate speech or uh, radicalization can take place on internet uh, and on social media platforms because internet provides the anonymity which all of us know and uh, the counter radicalization can also take place on the same platforms but because the effort uh, in the radicalization is uh, dispersed and it's uh, it's actually uh, coming from multiple uh, fronts it is very difficult for the state to do this and if you look at um, the uh, example of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, which uh, uh, India did this uh, major change in Jammu and Kashmir's uh, status uh, from a state to a union territory and um, amended Article 370. After that, the uh, control on internet uh, has been one of the important uh, points of debate and criticism, uh, especially uh, outside India uh, and in the West that uh, it curtails freedom of speech, it curtails uh, you know, uh, the um, access to information. But uh, there is a, a precedence to this because if you look at what has happened in uh, Jammu and Kashmir in 2008, 2010 and 2016, when an internet sensation who was a self-styled, uh, self-proclaimed uh, commander, a young boy named Burhan Wani, when he was eliminated by the security forces, the uh, mobilization of internet uh, on internet uh, against uh, his killing and the civil society uh, mobilization for uh, young people with impressionable minds actually resulted in the death of nearly 100 plus people or youngsters uh, in the clashes between the security forces and um, the, uh, the young people who were motivated by uh, the mobilization on internet. And uh, that is the case uh, why the Indian government has uh, now banned internet for almost uh, three and a half months. And uh, it's, uh, that is the dilemma that states will face. Do you uh, protect life? D uh, is the uh, right to life the fundamental right or is it the freedom of speech? And that's where I think the dilemma is going to come in as uh, we move forward in uh, this battle for uh, radicalization and de-radicalization. And uh, if you look at uh, the larger picture in India about, uh, I think, which uh, the point that Shruti made about uh, how uh, in a country like India where there are 400 million plus internet users, uh, very few people uh, percentage-wise went to join, went in to join the ISIS at its peak uh, by uh, being radicalized online. It didn't happen uh, by accident. I mean, it was not a sheer luck of uh, India. It is also because of the, the social and the family structure that uh, exists in India. The family uh, and the social structure support uh, and the uh, counter-radicalization that happens automatically. Uh, it's, it's not uh, something that was done systematically, but because of the social structure, because of the family structure, because of the kind of social uh, harmony largely prevalent in India uh, between communities and between uh, ethnic groups, uh, people have not been able to uh, really attract a uh, large number of uh, volunteers to ISIS. And you may challenge me on uh, this theory, but I personally and firmly believe that this is one of the reasons why so many people did not go. If you look at what happened in Maldives, 
in terms of percentage or numbers. I think the number of people who went and joined ISIS from India was uh, less than war the number of people who went from Maldives. Now it's because of the cohesion, uh, because of the uh, harmony that exists in India, despite so many religions, so many ethnic groups that are there. So one of the points for counter-radicalization is not just to focus on the uh, internet or focus on uh, online counter-radicalization, but also look at the larger society uh, at, uh, at large, rather, in the, the society at large. And that is why uh, the community mobilization that one of the speakers spoke about is extremely important. The community mobilization is not only on internet, but it's also uh, in real life, in uh, in day-to-day uh, -day existence. And therefore, uh, I would think uh, that if uh, ISIS could produce uh, sleek videos and uh, use mass media to connect or mobilize or motivate uh, people to join them in the at their peak in 2013-14, uh, I think uh, it is in. Uh, it is uh, very much possible in the realm of uh, the BIMSEC countries uh, with kind of technology that is available, the kind of knowledgeable people that are uh, uh, available to do similar counter-radicalization exercise by producing uh, programs, by producing sleek videos, using the same platforms as Facebook, Twitter or uh, Telegram for instance, uh, which is now the favored tool in India for uh, exchanging messages. WhatsApp is now uh, no longer the preferred tool. I see uh, hundreds of people on my contact list on the mobile phone switching over to Telegram to exchange uh, mails or exchange messages because ostensibly WhatsApp has now been uh, compromised by Pegasus as all of you know. But that notwithstanding, I would think uh, keyboard warriors who have managed to uh, radicalize many youths across uh, the world, but also in the BIMSEC countries, can actually share the good practices. Uh, those of us uh, who uh, look at it uh, from the point of view of media, or point of view of uh, um, giving publicity to counter-radicalization, can actually, uh, as you mentioned, share, uh, share uh, the good practices from each other's countries and um, then spread it around. Because uh, there are uh, good examples of uh, counter-radicalization in Bangladesh, in Singapore, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, uh, I, I can, one can go on in every country, there will be at least one good point uh, to pick up. Maybe this forum, uh, and I suggest this, that this forum, uh, the BIMSTEC think, uh, BIMSTEC think Tank forum here, can look at the best practices, compile them, and then spread it around uh, the, uh, the region, or at least this association of BIMSTEC countries. And uh, so that, you know, the law enforcement agencies, uh, the government, can really uh, look at uh, what can be done uh, on, on this front. Because uh, it is a given that uh, internet is only going to grow. Uh, the figures in India, uh, I was looking at them for 2019 January figures. Uh, although we say 400 million plus uh, internet users or mobile social media users, uh, this, the penetration is only about 30% or 33%. So the growth is only going to be phenomenal. We are a 1.3 billion population. And if you look at Southeast Asia or Bimstek region, it's only going to just grow. So I think uh, we need to think of uh, more innovative ideas, out of box ideas on this. And media can play a big role if brought on board at the beginning of uh, such a campaign. And uh, then we can become partners on uh, doing this. With that, I will, I think, end here and we can carry the forward discussion forward in a question and answer session. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nitin Pukali, for your uh, uh, insights. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, one of the key questions uh, to explore is uh, the identity of the local community as well. Uh, how do members of the local community see themselves? What are the others of the local community? I think, and then the growth of internet within the BIMSTEC. I, am, I agree totally with you, Mr. Nitin, that we will see a tremendous growth uh, of internet users, uh, either through social uh, media platforms or different others uh, in this region in the next few years. With this, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Umakan Adigari, who is uh, Under Secretary uh, in the Ministry of Home Affairs in Nepal. Please. Namaste, everybody. Uh, I am Uma Kanto Adhikari uh, from Nepal. Uh, first of all, 
thanks a lot, uh, BIF and uh, BMSTEC, who uh, we, uh, invite us to uh, come here and to uh, share our uh, experiences about a uh, new uh, topic. I think uh, uh, in that uh, topic is uh, uh, in the old uh, the, uh, this the emerging issues. I think over the world, not only be mistake or not only country. Uh, be mistake uh, uh, theme is uh, towards uh, uh, peaceful, uh, prosperous, and sustainable way. Uh, this is the theme, but uh, now uh, it is more than more uh, difficulties to bring by uh, uh, our uh, social media or internet. It is not only development or progress, it is also challenges for to make a uh, law and order. I think uh, uh, this is the uh, in our country, it is not a uh, big problem, but uh, sometimes uh, it may create a humor in the society. This uh, radicalization is not uh, uh, only for ethnic, uh, uh, to make, a, to make a propaganda only for ethnic, this radicalization is uh, many more uh, types. I think it is political. Uh, political uh, radicalization, cultural radicalization, uh, ethnic uh, radicalization, religious ra radicalization, it is many types, I think, like that. Uh, in, in our country, uh, now, uh, sometimes uh, to create uh, propaganda, to, uh, to, uh, situation of government uh, about uh, political political issues to make pro propaganda against government sometimes. So I think I, uh, I am agree with uh, uh, the before uh, speaker and now I am pointed about the, this radicalization and media is how to manage, how to uh, counter about this situation. Uh, radicalization, uh, we have uh, now in our country, we have uh, uh, many more um, social media uh, tools we, we use like Facebook, Messenger, and uh, like Facebook, 34% uh, entire population uh, uses in our country. Messenger, 18% uses uh, entire population. Uh, so it is uh, increased day to day. And uh, uh, it is uh, tools for uh, communication. It is tools for uh, sharing ideas but it is also tools for radicalization of many types. Okay. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, social media have uh, many uh, advantage, many more uh, this uh, benefits, but it's also a problem uh, created in society, uh, especially uh, okay. Especially, uh, I think I got here. Especially, uh, we uh, create uh, we faces critical and uh, relationship issues by social media, uh, notoriety, uh, dependence also, and uh, attack on intelligence property, lacks emotional connection. This is 
also disadvantage, decrease face-to-face -face communication skills, and reduce uh, family closeness. And I think uh, uh, radicalization is the, uh, the next step to make uh, then before in, in family, in houses, if uh, decrease face-to-face -face communication skills and uh, reduce family closeness, that is the problem. So, uh, social media in uh, radicalization, I think, uh, cyberbullying is uh, uh, since anyone can create a fake account and do anything without being traced, it has become quite easy for anyone to bully on the internet. That one, in radicalization, uh, social media using in radicalization. The next one is hacking. Personal data and privacy can easily be hacked and shared on the internet, which can make financial loses and lose to prof personal life. Similarly, identity uh, theft in another issue that can give financial loses to anyone by hacking the personal accounts. And uh, fraud and scam also uh, to create by uh, social media. Several examples are available where individuals have scammed and commit fraud through the social media and security issues like them. And uh, the next one, uh, it is problem, uh, and uh, it is also issue uh, social media in our country. I think one of the disadvantages of the social media that people start to follow others who are wealthy or drug addicted and share their views and videos on the web, which eventually inspires others to follow the same and get addicted to the drugs and alcohol. I think the uh, uh, role of state and civil societies uh, to address spread of radicalization, three kinds of programming may be necessary. Prevention programming, the first, awareness, public information campaigns, community debates, interfaith and intrafaith dialogues, capacity building for teachers and community leaders to support vulnerable youth, media, and uh, intervention programming is next. It's uh, referral mechanism we need, uh, psychosocial support, the next, mentoring, education and employment, training and support. And the third one is rehabilitation programming. This one is uh, prison-based uh, de-radicalization, disengagement, post-criminal aftercare programmers focusing on the rehabilitation and reintegration, returning foreign fighters and their reentry into society, Im educational and vocational training, counseling, employment opportunities, and ideological re-education. Uh, the means to check uh, radicalization through the internet and social media, uh, states and social media should be operate uh, countermeasures like censorship and to apply educational strategies, blocking of access and filtering content, early warning mechanism for emerging threats, to addressing demands and grievances. Uh, in my topic, in, in this topic, uh, way forward, I think, engaging communities to identify them, sustainable and replicable efforts to counter radicalization at the local level will not be achieved unless there is trust between different communities, between communities and the local and national government and between all 
these actors and the international community. To seek out appropriate interlocutors within these communities to unlock the potential of local communities to develop tailored local response to the threat of violent extremes. And I think my uh, suggestion in that uh, issue, ideological pro problems should be solved by means of ideology. Cultural problems should be solved by means of culture. Folk customs should be treated with the attitude of respect. Religious problems should be solved in accordance with re religious rules. Violent terrorism should be combated in the line with the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Umakan Adhikari uh, from uh, Nepal for, for bringing up, uh, the, again, the importance of local communities. And uh, here, <clears throat> I would like to say that uh, the, the need of or the need to push media and uh, information literacy programs within the, our, uh, our each countries, uh, even though there is a lack of evidence how that helps uh, uh, for containing or radicalization through internet and social media. I would like to request uh, our distinguished uh, speaker from Sri Lanka, Dr. Sandu Nika Hassan Ghani, uh, who is the uh, research fellow at, again, <laughs> Lakshman, I'm sorry about this, yeah, Lakshman Kadi Kama Institute of International Relations and Strate Studies, LKI, please. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you, uh, first of all, I think I have to thank uh, VIA for hosting this dialogue and also facilitating this dialogue and uh, for the hospitality as well. And um, yeah, the, so the, the topic here is uh, the relationship between uh, social media and radicalization and I'll be briefly talking about it based on my own research as well as uh, what I read uh, during last three years during my PhD. So social media and radicalization or ideological polarization uh, and preventive measures and policy implications. That's my uh, topic. Uh, first, I think uh, I'll just show you some data uh, about BIMSTEC as well as, uh, I have two sets of, two slides. Uh, the first one is internet and Facebook usage in, in the BIMSTEC uh, area. So basically speaking, more than 20% uh, of, roughly 20% of uh, the total population of each country is using Facebook. And Facebook is the most uh, popular platform in, the, in this region, just for you to have an idea of this social media. And the second one is social media is used for what? I mean, these are the type of things that we are doing. And unfortunately, this uh, survey is done by one of the Sri Lankan think tanks. Uh, called Learn Asia, and uh, it doesn't necessarily cover the complete BIMSTEC uh, region, but uh, at least it has four countries, so I just, uh, I just wanted to present that. So basically what we are doing on social media, I mean, we need to understand that first. So chatting uh, and staying in contact with family, making uh, calls and sharing, sharing videos and images, and Facebook uh, posts, and making new friends, and reading news, that's very important. Uh, playing games and at, uh, towards the end there's uh, this thing called follow following politicians as well like that those are some of the uh, things that we are doing on social media I mean uh, I really recommend you to go through uh, this uh, research because it has a lot of uh, data on this uh, on this uh, field although it does not necessarily cover the the link between social media and radicalization. And uh, that's just for your information uh, to set up the background. And the next thing, uh, as a researcher, as and somewhat linked to the academia, I always find that uh, for good policies, we need good data. So without feeding policies with uh, real time, as well as concrete, well-defined uh, researchers and the data gathered from those, we can't really make good policies. So one of the key points that I, I've, uh, I realized during last three uh, years when I was doing my research is that South Asia as well as the BIMSTEC lack data about social media and radicalization. Whereas uh, the Europe and the US, they are 
really, in, I mean, they are super advanced in uh, measuring radicalization, measuring ideological polarization, and measuring uh, uh, symbol equivalence on social media. So, as I mean, the, the very first point that I want to highlight and I want to suggest for the Beamstake uh, uh, officials is that it's uh, really necessary to start collaborative research and to uh, have constant dialogues. And I mean, we need very practical. Uh, uh, researchers, not just like, uh, you know, talking and stuff. Uh, so I have four points uh, to highlight, and as a, as a researcher, I, have, I always uh, find the gaps that we need to address, and very simple of four uh, points that I want to highlight. The first thing, the very first thing is that many of the speakers pointed out that radicalization on, I mean, virtual radicalization, and Online ra radicalization and offline radicalization are two different things. We need to understand that first. Because um, the first thing is that radicalization has this cognitive aspect, which I highlight uh, by that just the mind, showing the mind. It has the cognitive aspect and it also has the behavioral aspect. So uh, ba based on social media data, what we can uh, understand is mostly the cognitive aspect of radicalization because social media does not necessarily, I mean, social media data does not necessarily leads to, uh, leads us to have a conclusion on the real life actions out there in the real world because we cannot necessarily say that, okay, this post or this image or this uh, Facebook group really created uh, the Easter Sunday attack. For instance, in Sri Lanka, we cannot necessarily say that because there's this uh, empirical gap of uh, cognitive aspect of uh, social media data and the actual behavioral aspect in the real life uh, scenarios that we are all experiencing. So we need to uh, address that. And one way of addressing is, uh, one practical way of addressing that gap is actually we need to define what radicalization is and what radicalization that we are measuring actually. So the first thing, uh, one, one option, especially based on the European research and the US, uh, what they are measuring is uh, not necessarily, I mean they do measure, measure radicalization, uh, but it's not just online because it has a serious offline aspect. So if you are measuring online radicalization and if you want to have a serious idea of uh, online radicalization, one good way uh, is to measure the polarization, ideological polarization, because it's more mostly uh, cognitive. It's mostly about our views and attitudes. So we can uh, easily measure ideological polarization in this region, especially South Asia and the Beamstech. And also we have to focus on, um, we, ca we have to focus our research on the, the symbolic violence on social media. So that's the, the main thing I want to highlight in my first, uh, first that's my first point. Because unless we have a clear idea of what we are measuring and uh, what radicalization really is, I don't think that we can have good policies for this region at least. And the second one is, uh, what instigate radicalization, or personally I prefer ideological polarization on social media, what instigate radicalization on social media, let's say. So there are two arguments in the, two debates in the, in the field. The first one is algorithms are responsible, and the others are saying psychological biases are the most important, but we know that both are contributing. But I think uh, in, for this BIMSTEC region, as well as for South Asia, we really lack research, including, uh, I, ag I admit that including Sri Lanka, we really lack uh, this sort of research, the relative importance of algorithms and psychological biases. So what algorithms means that uh, algorithms, based on the data that they gather from the users, uh, what we are consuming on social media, they just uh, customize our next uh, online experience and that in that way they put us in a filter bubble so we tend to consume the same thing that we consumed before so we are not open for different views and different uh, uh, let's say different news sources we are not open to uh, different news sources because the the Facebook and other all, all other companies tend to 
customize uh, our user experience based on our previous data. So if I like, if I start liking football, then I, I tend to see more football on my news feed than cricket. That's the, the algorithms. That's how algorithms work. So we need to do more research on how algorithms work in this region because as I, I remember one uh, mention, I think that I'll share that this has a context specific, uh, because uh, the, the way algorithms work, algorithms are mostly working in the same way, but we need to check whether algorithms, whether it's the algorithm or algorithms or whether it's really the psychological biases are uh, the most relevant in this particular region. Because in some cases, uh, psychological biases could be the most important in our region, whereas it could be the algorithms in, in the Europe. So still the, the current research findings are still um, saying that psychological biases of individual, I mean by psychological biases I mean um, it's the individual choice, the way we are build up our own preferences uh, matters more than algorithms to be radicalized, to be ideologically polarized. So we need more research on that area. And uh, I'll briefly uh, conclude with the third point. Uh, the governing textual and visual contents on social media is one of the most important things that we need to do. And um, I would like to suggest um, I would like to suggest that more than textual content, content, uh, contents, we need to focus now, we need to focus on visuals. Visuals includes images, memes, as well as videos, and th there are different forms. Because uh, I was doing my, my PhD on images. It was an image-based uh, social media research. Because textual, um, we, we have AI uh, trained, different AI AIs like different computer programs trained for textual, uh, to monitor textual based hate speech and misinformation. But I mean, having an AI, a trained AI for, for all the images on social media is a really difficult task because it's context specific. So the image, I mean, let's say the, the lion in Sri Lanka has a different meaning than in, in India. So lion has different meaning. So we need to, uh, I think more than big data research, we need to focus on, if we want to focus on uh, hate speech and misinformation through images, then we have to focus on small data research. So now, these days, everyone is talking about big data research, which is fine, which we need, but I think we need small data research, which means uh, we need to uh, analyze narratives and discourses through images, as well as uh, we have text on images so the things become much more complicated sometimes. So, I mean, Facebook is already doing some, some uh, they have some programs to, to grab uh, text on images and things like that. But still, like, when it comes to images, it's, it's highly difficult to understand and, uh, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to define whether this is hate speech or not. In many of the cases, if you don't have the contextual background. So we need to focus on that. And there are all of counter narratives on social media. I think I'll skip that because like uh, many of us talked about it already and I don't really need to repeat. So that's my um, suggestions and the areas that we have to, I mean, we need to cover. And also I, I want to mention another thing that, I mean, counter narratives and uh, having AI, trained AIs and all those things are not necessarily de-radicalization steps. But those are, we have to understand that those are preventive measures, not necessarily de-radicalization, because de-radicalization is a bigger program that we have to do online as well as mostly offline. So that's uh, the suggestions that I have to do for Beamstech. Uh, I mean, I think we need to continue this dialogue in a very practical way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Santonica from Sri Lanka. Yeah. Uh, agree, particularly for bringing out and also reminding us the, the importance of data, data collaboration, collaborative research on this particular issue within the BIM stack. Uh, I would like to request, last not the least, uh, we have a speaker, Mr. Atik uh, Thong, Thong Gain, who is a lecturer at the School of Political Science, Sukhothai Thamathirat Open University, please.
Thank you so much. I think my topic is uh, related so much to the topic of uh, Dr. Hassan Kani, especially in the context specific. Uh, at first, let me share some experience from the southernmost of Thailand, named Patani area, where majority of population is Malayu ethnics with Islam religion, and to some extent, the local people there have common sense of glorious history as independent kingdom. In Patani, there are some perpetrated separatist groups, among them the Barisan National Revolusi or BRN is the champion in perpetrating violence. Their ideology is Malayu nationalism and their political goal is independence from Thailand or what they call in local Malayu language as Merdeko. My presentations uh, may be differ to uh, another speakers, but uh, that I will focus more on the contents or narrative delivered to the audience than the tools or platforms used to propagate uh, those, those narratives. Many scholars, journalists, and state officials from various countries always ask me, did ISIS influence the BRN and local Muslim in Patani? SMS they have done in many violent conflict areas. The short answer for me is no. I have not found that the BRN, Patani and Malayu and people and also ordinary Thai people engage with ISIS. There are at least two reasons why my answer is no. The first one is limitation of Malayu Muslim in terms of language. And the second reason is limitation of the ISIS popularity in the southernmost of Thailand. Uh, let me explain more clearly in details. Uh, the first one. It is fair to say that Muslims in southernmost or deep south of Thailand have limitations of the language, especially the Arabic language. And for those who are the exceptions, often study old-fashioned Arabic language in order to read and Quran and study religion only. That version of language is a different form from Arabic communication in present day. However, there are a number of Muslim students who further their higher education abroad in Muslim countries would have gained some knowledge of spoken Arabic. Most of them who graduate from Egypt, South Sudan, Libya, Pakistan, Indonesia, and also India return back to the country after their study, uh, studies and generally turn themselves into Imam or uh, in Thai language called Tok Kru. These people become the key actors as important influencers in shaping the audience perception about ISIS and Muslim world in Thailand. As a result, the main communication patterns of ISIS cannot directly reach out to local audience, but uh, indirectly through the Tokru or Imam. Moreover, while ISIS spreads out its ideology in other language, uh, including of English language, to various channels such as uh, online magazine Dabi which renamed later as Rumiyo, but only few audience access to the article. On the other hand, that is usually limited to scholars who study tourism and also study Muslim world. Uh, furthermore, reading English document is not very popular among Thai people too. Uh, in the second reason why I, my answer is no, for my second reason, uh, there are only a few number of youth in Patani that express popularity to ISIS, both in social media and in the public sphere. Their activities reflect very less potential tending to become foreign fighters for ISIS or any transnational terrorist groups. For example, once in three years ago, there are about six youths rising the black flag of ISIS road motorcycles around the downtown of one district in Patani province. A large number of people who saw that activities laughed at them. Because uh, it happened in Little Town, those villagers know well about background of youth and uh, who express uh, the, the what it called play like ISIS show on the street. Common people there clearly sum up that it was the expression like a mother punk or gangster more than the suspicious teenagers. A few days after, one famous imam in that district, deliver a sermon about the social and political activity 
which be in line with Islam doctrine. He also criticized the expression of those punting edges as well for uh, deterring imitation. That was not because he feared the spread of ISIS influence among Patani youths. Instead, he wanted to dissuade the youth from annoying other people. Both that Imam and ordinary people in Patani have confidently realized that the spread of ISIS ideology in their areas is next to impossible. Many Islamic scholars in the past often made a the Malay world include Patani as Rwanda of Mecca or in Malay language, Salambi Mecca. The southern border provinces of Thailand is the location of Patani Darussalam in ancient time. That kingdom play a role as an important center of Islamic study in Southeast Asia. At present, the uh, Malayu Patanian Muslims mostly play a role as the observers from that Rwanda paying close attention to the situations in the Muslim world, especially the Middle East region, center of Islamic narratives. They keep their eyes on many troubles, oppressions, and injustice that hammer on their Muslim brotherhood around the world, with almost the same fan, uh, painful feeling as Muslim Ummah, or Muslim is like one body. It should be noted that the emergence of ISIS in the uh, early stages was quite popular among Thai Muslim. But that popularity of ISIS in the eyes of some Patanian people is not in direction that they want to involve to fight, uh, fighting in side by side with uh, ISIS movements. Instead, as the concentrated observer from the veranda of Mecca, they look at ISIS as one of uh, some kind like hero who actively oppose the West and try bring, bringing back dignity to Muslim world. Historically, many Muslims perceive that the West consistently oppresses and insults Muslim world at least since uh, the collapse of Ottoman empires. This kind of narrative uh, overspread beyond the boundary of the Middle East to Muslim world as a whole, include the Patani as well. That trend is due to the globalization, Ummah worldview, and the deadlock of various protected violent conflict, especially the Palestine issue. However, after ISIS uh, published a videotape show Jordanian pilot burned alive to death and always show uh, very brutal activities, the popularity of them were dramatically uh, it decreased and incrementally turned to be unpopular among Patanian people. That because uh, many Muslim in Patani strongly disagree on any fighting that against the jihad doctrine. For many Patanian people, legitimacy of any armed groups who claim to fight for Islam is closely related to more to the means than the, in, the, than the ends. Uh, moreover, the ISIS focus too much on the near enemy. The near enemy here for ISIS, they refer to Muslim who be judged or takfin in Arabic language, as betrayed and took aside with the West so they were not real Muslim at all, or it's called a muradat. For ISIS, this kind of Muslim is the cause uh, that Muslim world cannot resurrect it from the oppression. That kind of political ontology is very bad response from people in Patani because it will encourage Muslims to kill each other. That is not in the same line with local interpretation of Islamic traditions. Uh, at first, I will finish my speech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. <coughs> Sorry. Mr. Atit uh, from Thailand for sharing us uh, uh, your experiences in Thailand, particularly southern part of the country. And uh, now we have five to one, so I'd like to take five minutes extra. So we will end at uh, five past one. So I will. Uh, so we will have a ten minutes. Uh, please uh, uh, tell your name and also direct uh, who you are uh, asking to. Please. Yeah. Just one request. Since uh, we have uh, shared the experiences and also some of the distinguished speakers have uh, uh, forwarded some uh, uh, suggestions for collaboration for future. Let's also focus on how we can cooperate and collaborate within Bimstead countries way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Tanzibul Alam. I come from Bangladesh. 
And I have got uh, same question for uh, uh, Dr. Pandalai and Dr. Hassan Ghani and as well as from Mr. Arthi. Um, uh, the narrations of uh, radicalizations uh, that we are talking about, it seems to me that all of you, and particularly for uh, Dr. Wu as well, that uh, it is a, uh, perhaps focused on radicalization of Muslims only. But whether that taking that view is actually somehow uh, missing the main point of the concept of radicalization, radicalization per se, and whether the concept of radicalization is actually differing in the context of the country's condition. For example, um, in the Indian context, we are talking about fear of radicalization about Muslims only. Whether um, the religious radicalization, even among Hindus, are also growing, and whether the, uh, the social media is being used as a platform for that and whether we should have actually focus uh, or should not lose focus on that. And similarly, when we are talking about radicalization in Myanmar, it is not the, uh, the Muslims who are actually radica radicalizing, or it is the, the Muslim hatred, hatred or, the, or the Buddhists are being radicalized against Muslims. And so is in uh, Sri Lanka also. There, although uh, Dr. Hassan Ghani has suggested about um, the psychology and the algorithm, I think that's a very interesting idea how uh, to address the, uh, the de-radicalization or change of the narratives. And whether in the, in the common context, whether we are actually need to take a broader view in, in terms of uh, uh, catering for the uh, anti-radicalization or de-radicalization. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I completely agree with you. I think the point that was made uh, in one of the comments is that, you know, we are looking not just at a particular re religion, religious identity in terms of radicalization, and I accept that. There's political, cultural, ethnic radicalization that needs to be seen in the larger spectrum. However, having said that, when as pure researchers, when we are looking at certain narratives that are coming out on social media propaganda, unfortunately, uh, which may be a lacuna of research uh, methodology in some cases, there is an inadvertent amount of information and propaganda material re regarding uh, fundamental sort of fundamentalist literature coming out of a particular school. Having said that, uh, I think I mentioned context at the very beginning of my talk. I think in India there are three narratives that we are focused on currently. One is, uh, of course, violent extremist organizations looking at the larger conversation on the global caliphate and so on and so forth. One which is we are looking at in terms of cross-border terrorism that is coming in into India, which is a proxy war which we've acknowledged for quite a long time, two decades and more of information warfare coming on towards us from the other side. And third is the internal issue where I've talked about, I think at fairly at length about fake news sort of and disinformation campaigns which are propagated by confirmation biases which are now creating issues in Indian society. So while I buy uh, your point on, you know, we are only focusing on one aspect of it and I accept that because when we did that survey that I talked to you about in my presentation, there was an overwhelming majority which said let's also acknowledge the context in which this conversation is happening. And I think that has been taken up quite seriously by all of us, including civil society in India, to push back against this sort of polarized, polar, increase in polarization in terms of our conversations, particularly vis-a-vis -vis identities. So I don't disregard that. I think there is a whole conversation that needs to be had. And like we said, uh, one of the problems with social media is the absence of gatekeepers of information. And if we can collaboratively, collaboratively come up with methodologies to sort of check this uh, misinformation campaign from spreading, we can go ahead and find some solutions. Thank Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. I think, uh, of course, radicalization is context specific, and also the other thing is uh, radicalization. At some point, is I mean, it's not necessarily bad. I mean, rad being radical. I mean, one can say that Mahatma Gandhi was radi uh, radical. Uh, I mean, or Martin Luther King is a radical. But um, so it's a. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a definitional issue. I mean. When defining and measuring radicalization, we have that aspect as well. And as you mentioned, of course, uh, it's uh, context specific. Obviously, uh, I mean, most of the Sri Lankan researchers are focusing on Sinhalese, uh, Sinhala Buddhists, and uh, Muslims and uh, the group uh, interactions on social media. So, which is understandable. And also, the other side is that uh, the polarization, as she also mentioned, that 
uh, one can say that the liberals are liberal views on social media and conservative views on social media, and it's uh, liberals are radicals, or the others can say that conservatives are radicals. So we have that, we have to manage that when, when doing research. Um, yeah, and, and, the, and I mean, uh, having said that, we need to adopt some practical uh, solutions uh, the gatekeepers and what the what what is the the role of the gatekeepers, for instance, um, is another thing that we need to address. Because let's say that uh, if uh, a particular news source is posting a very uh, 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 conservative or liberal whatever uh, ideas, then we need to suggest uh, on the same uh, Facebook wall or on the same platform that. There are some other optional readings that you can see. Uh, optional, uh, you can. There are five other uh, uh, optional readings, and if you wish to read, you can just click on it and read. So, which uh, for which we have to collaborate. And another thing I want to mention is that uh, so Facebook is the most popular, but uh, I don't really know whether the states, especially in this region has a direct communication with Facebook and other such yes. institutions. Yes. 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 Yeah, we have, but still like, uh, it's very, uh, we had uh, such conversations like after 2018, the, uh, the Candy uh, ethnic riots, which was uh, completely uh, social media based, right? Uh, but it was like kind of under uh, Chatham House rules and like no one knows what happened exactly, even I have no idea. Like I, ha I know some like basic, very basic uh, things published, but like other than that, no one knows. So we need, I mean, we need to feed Facebook such institutions with our data if we want to think about uh, to think uh, if we want to like minimize the effects. That's okay. Uh, let me answer first. Uh, you asked about the uh, why only Muslim when we talk about radicalization, right? Uh, bec uh, for me, I have because I have limited time for presentation. <laughs> so that I want to clarify the non-implication of ISIS and Muslim in my country at first. Uh, majority of Pakistanian Muslim uh, strongly hold the local tradition to blend Islamic way of life with many custom uh, in Malayu traditions. Uh, there has they has a basic li religious educational institution named Pono and Tadika. Many youths in Patani grow up inside that. Uh, hence, their will will are shaped so much from the role of local imam and local ustas or religious teacher. This kind of traditional social mechanis mechanism contributes much for protecting the youths from turning to be violent extremists in terms of religious interpretation like ISIS. In summary, my one of uh, argument from this presentation is that the existence of traditional Islamic institutions in local areas is one reason why the social media cannot be functioned as tools for radicalization in Thailand. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, with your permission, uh, just two, two quick points. I won't take much time, and I'm taking, it, uh, taking the cue from my colleague. Uh, very interestingly, if you look at New York Times or Washington Post, or perhaps uh, if you read Guardian, the ISIS features over there more than the ISIS features in general domain in the Facebook, which means people will much more be influenced by these mainstream media than what you see in the Facebook. So when we talk about online radicalization, you're actually talking about a very insignificant group of people who are functioning in the surface level. So when we talk about the dark and deep, that's a different uh, ball altogether. So we have to be very cautious about that. The second thing is about the religious aspect. That's why in my inaugural, in my uh, my statements, I talked about the ideological aspect, aspect because there is a sharp, uh, a sharp trending uh, to make religious statements into an ideological one and ideological per perspectives into a religious one. So it's very difficult to make a distinction between these two. So therefore, I think we need to really make a, make a, a concrete understanding of uh, whether we are talking about purely on one particular religion or if we are talking about the ideology that includes everything uh, to a greater expect. 
Uh, we researchers uh, often have a great habit with what I call selective amnesia. We certainly try to forget few things whenever we try to develop a methodology, and perhaps uh, sometimes we subside. But if you take the whole gamut of this uh, uh, radicalization, does not end in religion, but it actually transpires within the activities or whether you call it algorithm or you call it uh, behavioral aspect or cognitive aspect. So these research are pretty much there. So I don't think we have to reinvent that wheel, rather we have to think that on the basis of that existing knowledge what we can do. Number one thing that uh, BIMSTEC as an institution, rather than getting into the micro unitary issues, can look forward to set standards for these things which all the countries are already working on. So rather, harm, uh, rather than reinventing the wheel, we can always talk about that what country is having what kind of standards and bring together and uh, bring all this mm, together in a table and find out our own way of doing it. Second, the legal regimes are pretty much there. Harmonize the re legal regimes for particularly on this issue and definitely the transparency issue that we have talked about that who uses it, how it is being used and whether we should be dwindling between the freedom or saving our lives or whatever way we want to see it. Thank you. Next, please brief. Uh, thank you, sir. Commander Saini here from India. Um, I have two quick uh, questions. One is uh, cyber terrorism required to be defined across and uh, then only we will go somewhere. Otherwise, it will be just talks and nothing substantive. Second important thing is mainstream media is also not unbiased. It has its own biases and social media provide the counterbalance to it. So uh, suffocating a social media is not a solution to the problem. In fact, we should actively use social media for effective utilization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Les, please. Maybe uh, the, the ladies, uh, the, w the woman with the... Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Ruanti Jaisekar from the Institute of National Security Studies, Sri Lanka. I just um, thank you for the wonderful speeches given. So um, I do understand online radicalization. There's a difference between online radicalization and offline radicalization, but at the same time, these two are interlinked. Because observing what happened in Sri Lanka, even though um, the, one of the main reasons was the offline radicalization, offline radicalization system which was used. But the issue was online radicalization was spread and the materials were used and this was promoted through homegrown cells. Right. One of the major reasons, for, one of the major issues that we have right now is inability to tackle this blooming of uh, homegrown cells which do use these online materials, which is available online. So uh, is there any uh, mechanism or any suggestion that we could uh, utilize in order to tackle this problem, which is the offline radicalization based on the online materials? Do you want to say, any one of you want to say something? No, I was just going to quickly say that we've seen a similar problem. I come from a state called Kerala in India, and um, we to know that about 20 people from Kerala went to join the Islamic State uh, came to a sh came as a shock to many of us uh, about a couple of years ago because no one had ever imagined that you know while there is a significant population that the way they think they perceive and there's a definite connection to the Gulf uh, because a lot of the repatriation money comes from there but never had anyone established these links but if you see what uh, the Sri Easter bombing case and there's a gentleman called Rashid Abu Bakar who was arrested in Kerala. If you see the material that was exchanged and what he was, you know, looking at in terms of online content uh, and the way which he used to radicalize his entire family, the connection between offline and online of what you're talking about came home to us, uh, you know, hard. So there are there are existing examples. What did the Indian government do? We've set up a de-radicalization program where we are trying to focus on prevention, but the material is available, and like I said, to counter something, you need to know the narrative. So I think we are starting from the brass tacks, quite literally, and that's the way forward. Uh, Chair, Chair. Thank you for the, all the inter interesting discussions and suggestions. I'm not going to ask a question, just uh, my humble suggestion. You know, we've been hearing a lot about uh, reducing radical content, etc. 
I think the Beamstack countries need to share best practices on how to reduce the demand for radical content. We must reduce the demand for radical content. And Bangladesh has been, you know, working along these lines with theologists, religious leaders, extensively, and uh, mainstreaming the students, very young students who are doing religious studies, like in madrasas, etc. Making them, bringing them into the mainstream, actually, you know, opens them up to the uh, real world. And also working with the with our workers who are, uh, who are abroad, like we were hearing that they apparently share content without even anything to do with the country they are sharing because they're so far away. So let's work more on reducing the demand for radical content. Then, you know, half the work is done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, just uh, final quick points. One to uh, the lady from Sri Lanka who mentioned this. This connection between offline and online is something that uh, has to be uh, countered both by the state, uh, the agencies of the state, as well as the society. And therefore, uh, the awareness or the empowerment of uh, people who can prevent the spread of this uh, is, uh, becomes more important. And therefore, uh, every law enforcement agency or law enforcement uh, uh, organizations uh, must have a separate cell for looking at this. It could be radicalization on, across the religions. It's not just, uh, just a Muslim radicalization in Sri Lanka. It could be Buddhist, it could be Hindu in India. So that, uh, I think, it's a, it's a combination of measures that could be taken. And I agree with you, ma'am, about, uh, I think that's where I mentioned the family comes in uh, much handy here and uh, the family uh, values that uh, are there across South Asia, Southeast Asia. And uh, the, the, the effort has to begin right at the beginning, uh, right at the childhood. Uh, what is uh, good content, what is bad content, uh, I think uh, that uh, is something that must begin right at the age of five or six or ten. And then, you know, it goes up progressively. I think that's, that's the key. Yeah. Really. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Just two minutes of, uh, for chair remarks. Uh, I, uh, our, each of our country is rich with opportunities and also challenges. Each of us is uh, struggling with the radicalization on uh, internet and social media in our own context, also as a region. And uh, we should share our best practices, as ma'am uh, rightly pointed out, and then also the issue of collaboration, content sharing, uh, then also the issue of, like, for example, developing a communication toolkit as a, a, as a BIMSTEC region. I think this could be done. And coming from Myanmar, uh, I must say that we do have uh, the radicalization by interested uh, Buddhist fundamentalist groups. So it is not one particular region. I mean, it is being used by uh, those groups uh, who also radicalize uh, in Myanmar on uh, social media and internet. And with this, I would like to uh, thank uh, all these uh, distinguished uh, speakers uh, from BIMSTEC countries and also for your active participation. Yes, let's go for lunch. Uh. I'm sorry that I had to uh, interrupt because I see some more youngsters uh, raising their hands uh, in the back. Please engage uh, the panelists. Uh, you would like to ask questions during lunch time. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we have to agree this was a most uh, brilliant uh, session that uh, we even forgot that lunch is waiting for all of us. Uh, please join us for lunch at the porch on the ground floor. Uh, we will start session two at two o'clock.